You know, love is the most powerful force in the universe. Love shines brighter than the biggest stars. Love is stronger than the force of gravity itself. Love is more explosive than all the weapons of mass destruction that humanity can come up with. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. And that little word, love, packs a lot of punch. It's just four letters. But if we went around the sanctuary this morning, we probably have as many different understandings or definitions of love that we, that, that we do have people here this morning. But most of us as human beings uh, can relate to an experience of love that we've had with another human being. Sometimes that love comes through a relationship with uh, uh, our family, our parents. Sometimes that love comes through an experience with our children, our spouse, our husband, or our wife. Perhaps the strongest love relationship that we know in our human experience is the one that we share with our spouse. And most of us here this morning know that that love is a process. It begins kind of in that puppy dog stage where we're kind of infatuated with that person. There's that physiological eros love, that attraction. We want to be around them all the time. Uh, we'll, we'll lay up at night just to hear them breathe on the phone. Uh, we want to know everything about them and be with them all the time and share every memory. But then as that process of love unravels and we go uh, through that honeymoon stage of love, we come out on the other side of love, uh, that agape love, where maybe some of those very same things that used to attract us about those person have become maybe even annoying. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. I know my wife is not in here this morning. She would have given us an amen on that. Uh, we go to that stage where it becomes not about us. And we've got to make the decision to selflessly give to that person. To love them and provide for their needs above our own. And that process of, of love, it makes us vulnerable. It makes us connected to that person in a way that when they suffer, we suffer. When they feel pain, we feel pain. When they're excited, we're excited. Through that relationship of, of true, selfless, agape love, we have a bond that, that makes us vulnerable with that person. When our children are born, we automatically have a love for our children, that we would die for them, that we want to protect them, that we want to provide for them. That, that bond of love is, is there and just powerful. But many of us who have been alive for a little while and have been through this process of love know also that love, which is the greatest source of joy and inspiration and fulfillment that we can know, can also become the greatest source of pain in our human experience. When we love someone and they use that love to abuse us or to manipulate us or to trap us, or if we love someone so deeply and that person is taken out of our life, parted from us through death or sickness. And that person who our whole world was centered around is now gone. And we feel like our world comes caving in on itself. That can cause us the greatest pain that we can know in this life. I came to tell you today that sometimes love hurts. Let us pray. Heavenly Fathers, we gather in your word, we pray that we would have receptive hearts and minds, that you would speak to us, that this would not simply be a time of a sermon, but this would be an encounter with you, as we realize that your presence is right here, right now. God, that you would speak a word into our hearts that we can live by, that would transform us ever more into the image of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, from our perspective, our Earth is big, right? We live on a pretty big planet. But when you look at the Earth in perspective to our sun, our Earth is just a tiny little dot. A million of our planets could fit in the sun. You could line our Earth up, a hundred across, to get across the width of the sun. And yet our sun is this tiny little speck, this microscopic dot, it's almost invisible in the scope of some of the other stars out there. And to think that there's trillions of stars throughout our creation, throughout the universe, there's more stars and astral bodies out there than there are uh, grains of sand on the seashore. This vast universe that's continuously uh, being created and star nurseries that are expanding 
The totality and the scope of it is huge. And our very big universe reveals a very big God. In fact, I often tell people if they think their problems are too big, then perhaps their God is not big enough. Amen? And to think that the God who created all this universe is intimately involved in every human life, in every life form across this earth and across creation, uh, the, the, the magnitude and the scope of the power of this God, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? Our perception of God it is very small compared to the totality of who He is. Our human minds are not really created to grasp that totality and understand the fullness of God. Our understanding of God is about as small as our earth is uh, to the universe. We, we have a small picture, understanding of who God is. And throughout human history, we've sought to understand God and we've ascribed certain attributes to God. That He's omnipotent, that He's omnipresent, that He's omniscient, that He's all-knowing, that He's all-powerful, that He's necessary, that He's transcendent. But the terminologies that we use and the thoughts that we have to describe and to understand God are, are very small in the scope of who He is. The Bible tells us in Isaiah that His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And we can spend our entire lives trying to figure out God and never do it. But God has given us His holy word, the scriptures, breathed by God's own spirit, uh, so we can come into a relationship with Him. So when we're reading the Bible, we're not just reading ink on a page, but we're reading the living Word of God, breathed by the Spirit, wrote, written down by human beings, but a Word that brings us into an encounter, a revelatory experience with God. The Bible tells us who God is. It lets us know everything we need to know about God. It doesn't tell us all there is to be known about God, because that would be impossible. But it gives us what we need to know about God to have faith and salvation and eternal life with God. Uh, there are several things that the Bible reveals about Him, that He's a creator, that He created everything that is. Scripture reveals that He's a triune God, uh, a trinity, three persons, that is one being. Uh, scripture doesn't use that word, but it describes it from the very beginning that this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit brings everything into being that is. The Father speaking the Word. The Son is the Word. The Spirit, the breath of God carrying that Word and hovering over the face of the deep. We see a triune God from beginning to end. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, and this God is known as a person. He's a person in the fullest sense of the Word. Scripture reveals that God is a person and that He wants a relationship with us. And Scripture has given us uh, several names of God to contemplate over revelatory history. That He is Elohim, El Shaddai, the Almighty One. That He is Yahweh, I Am that I Am. That He is Yeshua, Jesus, Messiah, the Lion and the Lamb, the Alpha and the Omega. And that this God wants a relationship with us. Can I get an amen? amen. Are y'all with me this morning? This is a big God, and He's revealed some certain things about Himself that we need to know about Him. But the ultimate characteristic that God reveals about His being and who He is, above everything else, what we hear in this great love letter from start to finish, is that God is love. Above all else, above everything He wants you to know, is that He is love in the most profound sense of the word. That God is love. And love necessitates vulnerability. To be love in a love relationship with someone or something, it makes us vulnerable. We feel what that person feels. We experience what they experience. We're in pain when they're in pain. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. Throughout Scripture, we see a God that creates everything that is out of love. Just seeking to share Himself with His creation, uh, He creates this universe. We see a God who's there from the very beginning when humanity falls into sin. And He's there saying, where are you? Trying to put it all back together and establish this love relationship, this covenant from start to finish. And that love is brought to its fullness. It's brought to its totality in this one that we call Jesus Christ. Jesus is God in the flesh. He reveals the attributes of God. He reveals who God is. He is Emmanuel, God with us, the Most High God, the enfleshment, the divine mode of God's being made flesh among us. And Jesus reveals that God is love. In fact, Jesus indicates and reveals what love is, true love, 
And he lives a life of love. He lives a life of vulnerability. Jesus is love in the most profound sense of the word. In this one named Jesus, we see a power that can cast out demons, that can walk on water, that can manipulate molecules and turn water into wine, that can take a little boy's lunch and feed a multitude. We see a power in Jesus over life and death itself. But also in Jesus, we see a vulnerability. We see a Jesus who is conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mother Mary through the power of the Holy Spirit, and He's vulnerable to the human experience. He's vulnerable to sickness and disease. He's vulnerable to Herod's swords as they try to trace Him down and kill Him at His birth. He's vulnerable to temptation as He's led out into the wilderness. He's vulnerable to hunger and to thirst and the entire human experience, and He's vulnerable in this relationship with His disciples whom He loves. And perhaps no text in all of Scripture brings that together like the one we've been camped out in now for several weeks, the Gospel of John in the 11th chapter, and particularly in the 35th verse. Several weeks ago, we, we indicated that Martha found out Jesus was in town. Lazarus is deceased. He's dead. He's been dead for four days. He's been in the tomb. Jesus comes into town into a situation that by all accounts is beyond repair. Martha runs out to Jesus uh, and, and says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus tells her, your brother's going to be raised. And Martha says, yes, I know one day he'll be raised. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will not die. Even though they die, they'll live again. And those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And so Martha's understanding of Jesus and life and death and everything about God is reframed when she understands that in this one name, Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life is not just some event in the future. It's a person and his name is Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. Martha comes to that revelatory statement and then she's sent by Jesus to go back and to get her sister Mary. The Jews who've come from the surrounding area to come and console Martha and Mary are going through this memorialization process of remembering the life of Lazarus and dealing with the grief and the pain and the finality of his death. When Jesus calls Mary out of that place to where he is, Mary goes and the Jews follow her. They think they're going to the tomb, but they end up at the resurrection and the life. Where we pick up this morning in the 32nd verse. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said. Now the, the Greek actually is not translated very well right there. What Mary actually does is she runs and she falls at the feet of Jesus Christ. Here's the one who all our hope and, and faith is predicated upon. She sees Jesus. She runs to Jesus and literally falls down on her face in a state of worship, prostrate before the Lord, in a, in a state of, of humble uh, worship and reverence. And ladies and gentlemen, when we come into the presence of Jesus Christ, when we come to worship our Lord and Savior, we should have an attitude of reverence and humility. When we come together to worship our Lord and Savior, we should not be on our iPhone. We should not be doing our mental checklist of what we're going to do that way, or our grocery list of what we're going to do later. But we should come into the timelessness of His temple and to fall at His feet and worship Him with reverence and true humility. Can I get an amen? amen? When we come into the presence of the living Christ, we should come with an attitude of reverence. We are in the place of worship. We are in the presence of the living Lord, Jesus Christ, whom all our hope and faith is predicated upon, this one named Jesus. And Mary says to him, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. It's an accusatory statement against Jesus, but it's also a great statement of faith. Because Mary believes that Jesus could do something about the circumstances. It's a mirror statement of what Martha said to him earlier. What Martha said to Jesus. Lord, I know if you would have been here, you could have done something about this illness. Mary knows that because she's seen Jesus heal illnesses. She's seen Jesus cast out demons. She's seen Jesus do miraculous and supernatural things. And she knows that if Jesus would have been there, he could have healed Lazarus. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. And so at the feet of Jesus, she's laying there weeping. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. The Greek word there actually is, is, is more like anger. It doesn't really fit well in, in the situation, and so we interpret it as, as deeply disturbed. 
But there's an anger, there's a, there's a hostility that, that Jesus feels about this situation. And he's troubled deeply in his spirit. Oftentimes we see Jesus motivated by compassion and mercy and grace, which is an outgrowth of love. Jesus sees people in their point of need. He sees people who are sick, and he's moved to compassion. The word that's translated there is really, he's moved in his bowels to meet that need. In the core of his being, he sees people hungry and he wants to feed them. He sees people at a point of sickness and he wants to heal them. He sees people at the point of death and he's moved by compassion and his great love to meet those needs, to affect those circumstances. He's moved and operates in a power of love that when he sees that need, he's disturbed and troubled. He sees these Jews who've come to mourn. He sees Mary mourning, weeping, crying. And he's greatly disturbed and troubled. And he says, where have you laid him? Jesus wants to get to the solution. Jesus wants to know where the grave is. Where, where's the body? Where have you laid him? And folks, I came to tell you today that no matter how deep in pain or what kind of experiences we're going through in life that our need is God's opportunity and that when we're in a place of suffering and pain and trial that God is right there with us God wants to know where Lazarus is because he's going to do something to meet that need and when we re reorient our lives around the will of God and we're seeking to do his will our need is God's opportunity. And He's with us in our worst moments of pain and suffering. Where have you laid it? And they said to Him, Lord, come and see. How many of us here have the faith this morning to invite Jesus totally and fully into our lives? How many of us have the faith this morning to say, Lord, come and see? To throw open the door of our hearts, no matter what kind of secrets or darkness we might be hiding there. And to invite the presence of Jesus into our circumstances. Are we willing to let it all go? Are we willing to let Jesus all the way in? Do we think we have things we can hide from God? Or are we willing to invite Him in to know us fully and deeply so that He can transform us? They said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. Most translations there say simply, Jesus wept. Two words that pack perhaps the most profound exegetical punch in all of Scripture. Two words, Jesus wept. Now this is not just Jesus shedding a tear or two. The word there, weep, is he's weeping. He's crying. Who said real men don't cry, man? He sees them in their need. Mary's crying. The Jews are crying. And he begins to cry. He begins to weep. Now, our founder, John Wesley, of the Methodist movement, he was uncomfortable with this text. And he was uncomfortable with any text that emphasized too much the humanity of Jesus at the exclusion of the divinity of Jesus. Uh, and that's how this verse has typically been translated throughout history. Is that this is a statement. Jesus crying is a statement about his humanity. That, that a weeping Jesus tells us just how human he is. 100% human, 100% God, this one named Jesus. But I want you to, to open your hearts and minds this morning. Put on your spiritual hear, hearing aids. Wake up for me and listen to this. If you can get this, it will change your life. What if Jesus weeping... It's not a statement about his humanity at all. What if a weeping Jesus is a revelation about God's divinity? What if a crying Jesus is not at all about how much human Jesus is? What if about a crying Jesus is about how much love God is? A God who loves us so deeply and so profoundly that in our greatest moments of pain, that in our greatest moments of trial and heartache and suffering, that He's with us. He's not just sympathetic. He's empathetic. He feels what we feel. He's literally vulnerable with us in our pain. 
A God who loves us so much that no matter what kind of fear or pain you're facing or what kind of sin that you're entangled in, He loves you so much that He's become vulnerable for you. See, in Jesus Christ, we don't just see an omnipotent God in that sense of the word that He's all-powerful, that He can do anything. We see an omnipotent God that reveals His very power is love. And through that power of love, He transforms our human grief into resurrection and life. A God who created everything that is, but He takes a gamble with creation. It's risky. There's free will in the picture. As human beings, we have a will that can sometimes be opposed to God. But God creates us and gives us that will. All of creation has a will. And He moves and He works in the circumstances of that will, even when we're disobedient. And even in the consequences of sin, sickness, illness, and disease. What about a crying Jesus? It's not about his humanity at all. It's about his full divinity. Do you know that God loves you? Do you know that God cries with you? That he suffers with you? That you are his precious child and he loves you? And his love is greater than the biggest stars? His love is wider than the entire galaxy? He loves you that much that he sent his son, that he became flesh, vulnerable, Love, <clears throat> compassion, and grace. Jesus wept. And so the Jews said, see how he loved him. Now remember, some of these Jews that are here gathered together are going to be the very same Jews that are going to follow Jesus. But some of the other of these Jews are going to be the ones that make the decision that Jesus needs to die. When Jesus does this thing in Bethany, he understood as the very miracle that would lead to his glorification, his crucifixion, Obedience to the will of the Father. These Jews that are gathered here are going to take this event. They're going to use this as the reason that Jesus Christ must die. But even they, they can make the recognition to see how they, he loved him. But they don't understand the profound sense of that love. See, this is not just one human being crying for another. This is not just a teacher crying for his student. This is a God crying for his child. This is the creator crying for his created. That Lazarus, uh, he created Lazarus, knows every hair on his head and the breath of his days. This is a God who's profoundly loved, that loves Lazarus. They understand that he loves them, but they don't understand the profound sense of that love. Can I get an amen? amen. And then the other Jews say, God, could he who not have opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? There's always going to be the naysayers and the haters in our lives. Amen. The people who stand on the sidelines and say that will never be anything. Or who is this? If he could have done this, then why couldn't he have done something about that? What Jesus is about to demonstrate, folks, is that in him is this perfect love, this perfect power that is the resurrection and the life. And when we come to terms and realize the profound sense of God's love, it calls for us to have a response. Of everything that scripture says about God, the thing that it shouts over and over and over again is that God is love. In fact, the clearest statement about who God is all in scripture and in the first book of John says, those who say they know God and don't love don't know God because God is love. When the people got Jesus against the ropes, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the scribes, and they say, teacher, what is it all about? What's the greatest commandment? How do we live our lives? What's the thing we need to know to have eternal life? And Jesus answers them with one word, four letters, love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It all comes down to love. They say, what do we need to know about the law and the prophets? What really counts in this life? And Jesus says, love. Can I get an amen? amen. He is love in the most profound sense of the word, and he's called us to be love. We are his body. We are his hands and his feet in this world. We are a manifestation above all else of God's love. And our witness as Christians is not just about having the right answers or a neat theology or having the words to say in a moment of human suffering. Our witness as Christians is one of being with, of being vulnerable with those that are in need, with being hungry when people are hungry, with crying with
with them when they're crying. And so when we come to church every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, and we know that just outside the walls of this congregation are people that are sick. There are people that are suffering. There are people in nursing homes that need a visit. There are people in our community that are hungry. There are people who need the love of God. And if we come to church Sunday after Sunday and we abate our eyes and turn around from that need, well, then we're not Christians at all, folks. We should take the cross off the wall because God is love. And He's called us to be love. And that love can be the most rewarding, exciting part of our lives. Getting the gospel to people, meeting that need. But sometimes that love can get messy. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes we've got to get down in the gutter in the jail cells. Sometimes we've got to go places we don't really want to go and do things we don't really want to do to witness the love of God in people's lives. But no matter how bad it hurts or no matter how messy it gets, we're called above all else to love. We are the body of Christ in this world, His hands and His feet. And we're called to love. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians in the 13th chapter, says that if I speak in the tongues of angels and have not love, I'm only a resounding law or a clanging symbol. If I have all manner of prophecy and knowledge and can discern all things and have not love, it means nothing. If I sell everything I have and give it to the poor, I gain nothing. If I turn my body over to the flames and have not love, it means nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not boast. It does not arrogant. It's not self-seeking, but it seeks to meet the needs of others above ourselves. Love, hope, and faith remain, but the greatest of these is love. Faith and hope will come to an end when we're in the presence of our Creator for all eternity. But love will never die. Because God is love. And He's called us to be love. And His love is greater than Canis Majoris, Beetlejuice, or any star or any other body in this universe. His love is far as from the east is to the west. And it's the greatest power of creation. And He loves you. And He's called you to be loved. And so I've asked this morning that you would put on those cards, how are we loving our community? How are we being a witness to God's love out there in the world and sharing that love, that great love that we've been given with others? And when you come down to the communion table this morning, I'd like you to bring that index card. Love can be the greatest sense of joy and fulfillment in our life, but it can also be the greatest source of pain when we get out there in love and people use it against us to hurt us and to injure us. But even when love hurts, We've got to keep loving. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your table now. Let us clear from our minds all the concerns of the world. Let us focus totally and solely on you as we come to this, the centerpiece of worship. As we come and have this chance to lay down our sin, to plead for your forgiveness, and to receive again this grace and mercy. To remember that this is how much you loved us. That this is love. A crucified God on a cross, vulnerable and dying for his people. And so when we come to your table, we don't just simply remember that sacrifice, but we have communion with you. And so, Lord, as we come down to the table today, let us realize that you are with us. Let us realize how much you love us. And if we feel so led, let us stay at the altar with you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.